All right, let's start. Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you for, for joining on this uh, quick session. Uh, in, enjoy your lunch or your, your dessert probably by now. I, I really like the pistachio dessert, by the way. That was very good. Um, I would like to spend about half an hour um, telling you a little bit about um, signals and slots in Qt. Um, the generic term, we're going to look into the, the Qt object model a little bit. Um, but uh, before that, my name is Simon Hausmann. I work on this stuff. Um, I work as a software engineer in the Qt company here in Berlin, or outside of Berlin. And um, yeah, I would like to give you a quick dip into the Qt object model. Uh, the background for this is that the primary purpose of our object model in Qt, with Q object and all of that, is to make it really easy to pass messages between objects. That's really the, the heart of the functionality. Um, and we try in Qt to make things easy to use and fun and safe. So that's really, really important for us. And the two primary ways of, of delivering messages to objects in Qt, um, which you may have uh, used before or seen before, is either events, things like um, I'm receiving a mouse event, I'm receiving a keyboard event, uh, a touch event nowadays. Um, those events come from the outside. We are not going to look into those uh, in this quick session, but instead we're going to look at signals and slots, the other way how one object, one Q object can talk to another Q object without the two of them really knowing about each other. Um, so my goal is to not explain, not to tell you what signals and slots are, but what, we are, what I would like to show you is how things work a little bit on the inside. So to give you a bit of a glance on how, how we're actually doing this. Um, so I'm going to show you how a signal ends up calling a slot. And then in the second part, we're going to look at how that even works in a multi-threaded application. Uh, if you would like to dig even deeper into this, uh, Bo Thorsen has a presentation tomorrow that is longer, um, where he's digging into this stuff as well, but he's shoveling a little, little bit deeper than, than I am, I think. It's tomorrow afternoon, I think. 11-something. 11-something. Look on the schedule. Bo Thorsen is the guy. Anyway, so... I am not big in doing slides. I, I like to show things real. But, so I'm going to look into, I'm going to show you everything else in Qt Creator. Uh, but before I start with that, I just wanted to one, say one thing. Uh, if you have any questions, if there's anything either unclear about what I'm doing up here, or, or if, there's, if you're curious how something works, um, don't wait with asking your question until the end. Just raise your hand right away, and then I'd like to answer the question right away. I love getting questions. <laughs> Um, so, the example that I would like to use to demonstrate to you a bit how we do signals and slots inside is, is a, little, uh, a little calculator. That's the simplest example I could come up with. Um, I'll show you first how it looks like, because it's, it's a really, really awesome looking calculator. I'm, I must have been a UI designer in my former life or something, because this is really, really good. So, I'll show you first how it looks like. This is the calculator. This is terrific. This is the latest flat. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hours and hours of hard work, I'm telling you. <laughs> so this thing can, can do calc math, very complex. Three plus four, seven. First approximation is correct. Um, and this thing uses signals and slots. Um, so looking at the source code here, we have whatever I'm talking about, I'm trying to highlight. So that's the blue stuff. Uh, we have a main window. That's our, our user interface. And, uh, and our calculator is a separate object. It's a happens to be a Q object, but that's a separate object. And the user interface has a signal here. We're having a signal co uh, co slot connection here um, that has a signal that is called evaluation requested. So that's after I've entered a binary expression or arithmetic expression in this awesome UI. I type enter, and then the main window will emit a signal. It says, hey, user has requested to evaluate this, this uh, complex mathematical expression. And we're connecting that to the calculator. Uh, that has a slot that is called evaluate. And because we're doing really heavy-duty work here, uh, that calculation might take a while. 
And when the calculator here is done, we have connected this signal of the calculator that says, I'm done with the heavy work. I've got the result for you. It's right here in a string. You can show it. Um, we are connecting that to the Windows display results slot. So the communication is from window to calculator. And when the calculator is done, from calculator back to the window. Fairly straightforward. Um, the calculator itself, if you just go here, or actually you can just go into here. Qt Create is awesome, because you can just go there and type F2, and it goes straight to where it is. Uh, so this is our calculator here. And it's a Q object, and it has this our famous macro. Uh, and it has this evaluate slot. And um, because I'm a bit lazy, I didn't do any of this calculator thing myself. I'm just going to use, I'm cheating. I'm using our little embedded JavaScript engine. Uh, and, and that's how in the implementation we actually uh, calculate, uh, do, the, do the work. And then that's also where we right away emit the signal. But in principle, if you do this for real, if you do a real calculator, this, is, this will be a little bit bigger. But just for this demo, uh, that is enough. So let's look at how this works. So I'm going to run this again. And I'm going to set a breakpoint here in this line. This line. Um, and then. We're going to see what, what this actually looks like, or how we end up from emitting the signal in the GUI to ending up here. So I'll run this in the debugger. Here we are. So I'm doing, it won't do anything right now. The breakpoint isn't hit. But if I do it again, my 4 plus 5, I hit Enter. The debugger stops. And we are in our slot called Evaluate. Here it is highlighted. So that means it works. That's good. But let's go back in this call stack, uh, call stack here. We go back to our main window. Here we are. This, if you can see this, uh, this is a, a lambda expression. So we have an input field. This is our Q-line that, that emits the signal when I'm hitting Enter. And in here, we, we emit the signal, the evaluation requested signal. And this, is, this looks like a magical expression, but as it turns out, this is nothing more than a function call. So it's a valid expression. Uh, so emit is actually just something that makes code easier to read. Emit itself doesn't do anything. So I could also just write this. It would have the same functionality. So emit, if you look at the definition of it, this is emit. Emit doesn't do anything. <laughs> but it makes the code easier to read. When you read this code, you see, aha, what's happening here is important. This is where our, our object tries to signal something to the outside. There's a message to be broadcasted to the outside. This is why we sometimes do these seemingly weird things, but they make code easier to read. And that's really important. So if we scroll a little bit down in our main window, I'll make this a bit smaller. Uh, here we have our signal declared. Um, but we've never implemented this ourselves. Uh, and this is because uh, we have the meta object compiler that behind the scenes looks at all of the signals and slots that you declare. And it, for signals, it, it provides the, the, us with the implementation of this function so that we can just call it here. And that generated code will, is responsible for then calling all the slots. So this is also the next uh, call in our call stack. So if we go one frame up, we end up in, in this call here. Just make this a bit bigger. Here we are. So this, is, this code looks so ugly, it must be automatically generated. Um, and here we have our parameter. The T1, it's called as a generic term, but this is really our expression. And what we do with it is, I'm going to scroll a bit to the right, is we're going to take the address of this thing. So we're not making a copy of our parameters of a signal, but we're taking just the address of it. That's a practically free operation. And we're going to do some really, really ugly casts. You did not see those casts. Pretend they are not there. And we're going to take essentially the address of all of the parameters. We, we stuff them into an array of void stars. So we've lost all of the information. We just have the address of our parameters. And after that, we call uh, the belly of the beast. We go into Qt itself. 
here, and this is an internal function, and this takes as a parameter the object that actually sends the signal, that's us, the main window. It takes the address of a static matter object, and this is a data structure that is also generated. So we not only generate this function, but we also generate the data structure that describes what those parameters are. We've just gotten rid of the information that it is a string as a parameter, but that information isn't really lost. It's stored in this generic data structure. And then we pass the index of the signal. So that since we have only one signal, it starts at zero. But if this was the third signal, it would be the value number two. And we pass the parameters. And in this call stack, if we then go a bit further, now we're inside of Qt. So this is not the generated code anymore. This is inside Qt. This just forwards. Uh, this activate call just forwards to another function. There's an overload in there. And now we're deep inside code that looks really, um, I have never seen this before, kind of locking and all sorts of stuff. That's fine. Doesn't matter. Um, this is the stuff that just works. But now, after two call frames, we come back into our calculator. So from the main window and two internal calls, uh, we are now back on the receiving end, where our calculator is in a function that we also have never seen before, or we've never written it ourselves, because it's generated. Uh, and this function then knows how to, if you go to the correct line here, uh, this is the function that knows how to take this void star that's, that's in this array here, and it casts us back to a string, and then calls our slot. So if the other side wouldn't have put a string into this, it would have crashed. But this kind of check, checking that what the signal emits and what this in the, the slot receives, checking that those are compatible, this happens when calling QObject Connect. Or depend, yeah, this happens when you're doing QObject Connect. So from here, we go back into our calculator, and then here we have the expression as a, as a result that was provided by the main window. The one other thing I would like to explain briefly is, um, is that the calculator has this QObject macro, and this QObject macro is the one that expands to a declaration of this function, this static meta call. That's just a static class function. This is what this macro expands to, and it also expands to a variable declaration that describes what parameters we have. This, we call this the static meta object or meta object data. Um, this is also what the mock generates behind the scenes for you when you use signals and slots. This looks this is a very simple data structure. Really, this is this is the heart of it. Uh, I can just make this a little bit bigger, but this is the heart of the data structure. It's an array of integers that's read-only, and it has uh, has some comments, but it has just integers. Said, okay, this is the version of the mock that we were using. Uh, this is an index and an array of strings. This is the class name. Uh, these are, there are two methods in there. There's a slot and a signal. Both are methods. And if we had properties declared, there would be more things uh, here. And then there are more fine-grained. Uh, there's more fine-grained information about those signals uh, stored here in a, in a binary form encoded. And we even have the signal parameters, by the way. This is where our our calculator signal, uh, or where we recorded that our calculator signal has a Q-string as a parameter. For custom types, for your own types, we, we, store just the, we just store the name of that type, and then at runtime, we're going to resolve that. So this, this is how signals um, end up calling slots. Oh, there's a question there. Uh, the question is, does this work with derived objects? Um, it does, um, naturally, because calculator is derived from QObject. Um, and if we derive again from calculator, uh, that would still work, um, because this static meta call um, is per class. And when we do the connection, we figure out which static meta call do we have to use, so despite the duplicated name. And there's also a virtual function that calls the parent implementation, and that respects the class hierarchy. So signals and slots do work well with class hierarchies. Um, but the, for slots, the behavior is, um, depends whether it's polymorphic or not, depends on what kind of Q object connect syntax you use. So let me just recap quickly. 
Four, four, six. Oh, there's another question. Yes. This requires a microphone. Hello. Uh, why was there a null pointer passed inside the parameter array? That's a great question. So the question is, why is there a null pointer here? Very good question. Thank you. Uh, because there is a secret Hello. feature. Uh, the secret feature is that if you look at the declaration of our signal, it returns void. But you can actually return something. You can say int, for example, or qString or whatever. Uh, you can actually have a signal return something, um, which works really well if only one slot is connected to the signal, because if the slot also connected an integer in this case, then that will be returned to the signal. So you can actually pass information back. It becomes a bit more awkward when you have multiple slots connected to a signal, because then we will return the last value. But um, it's this return value, so let me just make this back. It's this return value that is encoded here, or as there is nothing, we just have a null pointer. But it's the address of a, of a temporary return value then. One more question. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, one, so, more, one more question. Okay, Sorry. one quick question, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so, is uh, execution of the slot separated in time from emitting the signal? Yes. So, when you emit a signal, um, the control will only the, the control will only return from emitting that signal after all the slots have been called. Um, it's a little different when you introduce threads, but we'll get to that in a in a few minutes actually. So, quick recap: signals and slots. We generate code behind the scenes. We look at what you declare and what you don't. And we generate data structures for it, and we generate stub code that knows how to call your functions, basically. And emitting a signal is really just a matter of um, calling a function that we have generated for you. And we, take, we avoid copying data, so it's really, really efficient. We don't take, a, take a copies of all of the parameters, but we really just take the address and pass that on. So I want to quickly move on to another cool feature, the second part, which is what we're going to do now, is we're going Simo? to make this calculator multi-threaded. There's a quick question. OK, very quick. Uh, oh, just one question. Uh, this code path that you have shown, uh, is this the same code path that is taken when we use the direct connection and the queued connection? Um, the code path is almost the same, yes. I'll show the queued connection now. So what I want to do is I want to make this uh, a multi-threaded calculator, or a threaded, I'm not going to use more than one thread, um, so by introducing a thread. I'm going to call it as the worker. And I'm going to, well, I need to start this thread. That's how it is. And after we have started the thread, um, we can move our calculator object to the other thread. So threads are associated, uh, sorry, objects are associated with a thread. So what I can do now is I can do calculator move to thread to move this thread to the worker, to the wo to move this object to the worker thread. <laughs> um, and that's actually it. I also need to do a bit of cleanup, so I'll do this here as well. I need to connect to the, when the application is closed. Um, but, Last window closed, and I need to put a little lambda here to terminate my thread properly. So when I close the window, I want the worker thread to quit its event loop, and then I'll wait until that is actually done. So yes, the calculator is, uh, is allocated on the stack and the thread as well, but the calculator dies before the thread dies. Uh, so that's why this is fine uh, in this example. But we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to complete this example, and then we have to do more questions. Um, so all I've done here is I've created a thread, and I've moved the calculator into the thread. I haven't changed anything else in the program, um, but it's still going to work. I'm going to boldly claim. So let's just check this quickly. It comes up. That's a good sign. Now that we're multi-thread, we can do much heavier calculations. I'm going to add 1,000 to 300. This will take a little longer, I think, but 
we're multi-thread, so it's okay. But it still works. So I haven't really changed anything in the calculator or in the in the GUI, and suddenly this thing can delegate information to the thread. And those queue object connections still work across the thread boundaries, which is quite cool, actually. I can show you how this looks like now, again, with a backtrace. So we're going to look into, into evaluate. I still have the, uh, the breakpoint here. So if I run this again in the, in the debugger, I have my UI here. And evaluate is still being called. But if we look at the call stack here, so static meta call, and we look a bit further down that list, there's no main window there to be seen. None at all. And this is because the main window lives in another thread. And what happened in between um, is that we used an event behind the scenes transparently. If you look at the list of threads here, uh, the third one, QThread, that's our worker thread. I didn't give it a name, so that's why it's just called QThread. Whereas calculator here, the first one, that's our main thread. It's named after the executable. So if I switch to that thread, I get a very different call stack. In fact, I'm in, in main and queue application exec. So I'm actually, sorry, I'm actually here. So the calculator is, have, is, is running in a different thread than the UI and both of them are different, but yet my slot was called. If I go back here, I'm still in that static meta call here. But if I go back one f stack frame further up, now we're in a different function. Earlier we were in queue meta object activate. Now we're in a, in a function called queue meta call event. And that's because uh, when we emit the signal, we figure out or we determine that the receiving object is in a different thread. It's not in the current thread. So I can't call it directly. I can't call the other slot directly. It's in a different thread. So instead, what we do is we take all of those parameters, and this is the time where we make a copy of them, and we put them into a queue event, a meta call event. It's this very class. And we post it to the event loop of the other thread. And when that event loop spins, it will process that event, and it will call our slot. I have a beautiful diagram that shows this, actually. This is how it looks like. So when you have multiple threads, I stole this from our Qt documentation. <laughs> um, each thread has its own event loop. And when we uh, emit a signal and we find out that the receiver is in a different thread, we just post an event from one of those. So in this case, from the green box, that's our main thread, we post it to one of the other uh, event loops in the other thread. And that will then finally call our, our calculator in this example. And when that one is done, it will do the other thing in exactly the other direction. It will do the reverse. It will emit the signal, and we find out that the main window is in a different thread, and it will post an event back. And that's basically how signals and slots work across the boundaries of threads. And the cool thing is that it works out of the box. So as you've seen in the, in the example, I've changed a few lines of code here. I've changed just, I've created a thread, and I've got to do a bit of cleanup work. Uh, but I haven't changed anything else in the application. And that gives a really, really powerful, powerful tool. So we're running a bit low on time, so I'm going to skip over the summary. The summary is exactly what I just explained. We make it really, really easy to pass messages between threads as well with the same signal and slot mechanism. And behind the scenes, we determine how, how do we actually call and pass the information around. And it, it, we tried very hard to make it as fast as possible and as cheap as possible. So now the hands are coming up, which is great. Uh, let's behind Vikas. It's okay. So the question is, how do we, when we do have to take a copy of the parameters, how do we do that? Um, and this is we do this by having a we have a type system and we have a, a list. Um, of uh, type information where we know for each type that you pass, even your own types or custom types, uh, how do we call the copy constructor and how do we call the assignment operator, basically. So we know, we have, we know how to take uh, copies of types, of your own types as well, through so the meta type system, basically. Um, and that's how we can do this. But we only need to do this when we do call into another thread or when it's a so-called queued connection. Sorry, if you. I can get away without the constructor. 
I'm not using it ac across thread yes. boundaries. Yes. So when you when signals and slots don't cross the thread boundaries with those types, you don't need to register anything. There's no type system, anything involved. As you've seen, we just take the address of your parameter, stuff into a void stand the other way around. Uh, Vikas was next, I think. And maybe you can go to the microphone in the meanwhile. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there are two objects involved in the connect statement, right? And one of the object dies, the connection is lost, right? What? Yeah. And when I'm using lambda, and let's say I have an object inside it, yes. which can die before the source object from which, where the signal is yes. emitted dies. So I use the object used in the lambda as a guard object in the connect statement. Is it a right way to do it, or there is any better way to? You use which object? You use the, the object which is inside the lambda. Let's say it's a Q object. I use that as the third parameter yes, of the Q object yes. statement. Uh, that is that's a good way to make sure that your lambda is also not called anymore when the object dies. So there, you can call Q object connect with a signal emitter, mm -hmm. the signal, and then either the lambda or mm -hmm. another Q object and the lambda. Okay. And that fourth form is the one that will automatically disconnect when the the receiving Q object actually dies. So I'm doing it right. Yeah, one problem is that uh, you cannot use templates with the Q object, but yes. I know of a framework which is uh, just macros and template programming, which yes. uh, uh, I don't remember the name. Starts it, with a B, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's quite cute, and it would be really fine if it would be integrated into Qt to just for the power users to use it, and for those who don't know it, just ignore it. Are there plans to do this? Um, at the moment, we don't have any plans of, 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 uh, of doing that, but um, the building blocks are there of integrating other, net, other mechanisms, because the, the, the way we call slots, for example, is something that, is, that doesn't really change much. And even this, um, this class called Qmeta call event is something that is technically accessible to you. So you could, or I think it is at least. Um, so I think it would be possible to write such an integration even from the outside. You may have to use a little bit of internals to do that, but it's possible to, to integrate that, I think, in principle. But at the moment, we don't have any plans of, of um, integrating another third-party signal and slot mechanism, because this works really well for us. And no, it was about templates in QObject. Oh, uh, uh, no, no, templates is something that we at the moment also um, don't support. It's a bit more complex to support as such. Uh, I, my hope is that in the very, f in the very future, um, with, with uh, meta classes, um, we may be able to have something like that, or this may be possible to do, as the compiler can generate this metadata that I showed. But at the moment, that's not in our plans. No, there is a framework which you can already use with Qt. I just forgot the name because it's a long time ago I used it. Okay. And it works with templates. But maybe uh, you remember the name and tell me afterwards? Yeah, maybe. Huh? So what, what Olivier, Olivier, Olivier Gonfard, uh, did a blog post as the yes, degree. Yes, what Olivier wrote is a way of doing, uh, generating signals, uh, generating this method that I showed, generating that using a, a whole bunch of const expressions. Uh, and that's a very impressive, uh, that's a very impressive uh, demonstration, actually, of, of, of code. But it's, it's not very practical at the moment to include this in Qt, plus we can't rely on some of those things. But yes, it shows that things, so what, what he's doing with this magical const expression uh, tree that generates all of this data, this is what metaprogramming will give you, basically, but in a much more convenient way. Time? I'm so sorry. We're out of time. But thank you very much for eating your dessert here or attending the presentation. <laughs>